I was talking to Sean Paul about this amongst them. One of our players was playing for Derry in a, an All Ireland semi final a few years ago, and she had a couple of chances. And after the game, a couple of I was not the game, a couple of people said to me, I she should have done this. I'm going to come back to those two words, should have, no, you're not. She should have done this. All right, and she should have done that here. She's never played full forward before. All right? The, things that she, the thing that she should have done was hand pass the ball onto the goals. Nobody had ever said to her, if you're playing full forward, here's how you can hand pass the ball into the goals. So, if you've never done it, it's like going to an exam and getting a question on a topic you've never covered. If you've never uncovered it, how can you ask the question? And yet somebody expected her to do this in the most high profile game of the season for the county. She wasn't able to do it, it wasn't her fault. Okay? The point of a job description was a guy, Robin McConnell, from New Zealand, he was involved with the All Blacks team. He lectured up in Jordanstown a number of years ago. If anybody here did sports studies, you might have come across him. Very, very good guy. He was involved in the back room of the All Blacks. Remember Sean Fitzpatrick was the captain. Um, and uh, he wrote, he's written a book called Inside the All Blacks. And one of the things that they did um, was that they wrote out job descriptions for individual positions, the, the characteristics and the criteria that they had to have to play a particular position. You know, so in rugby, all right, we've got a flanker and he has to be able to move around the pitch quickly and he has to be physical and aggressive and one break the ball. Different skill set and physical abilities from the winger and the fullback. You know, if you have a player playing a particular position, you need to tell them, particularly for, for girls, because they don't have the same tactical awareness. They don't have. It's a fact. They don't watch as much football come back to this, but they don't watch as much sports, so they don't have the same tactical awareness. So you need to coach the position. And then what happens in a game? You're liable to make a switch that they're, they're the result of the, the third person down the chain. They've switched her to there, her to there, and this poor soul gets moved back to wing back. They've never played there before. Are they able to play that position? Have you covered it in training? So what individual position coaching do you do in your training sessions with, with your football team or your camogie team, your ladies football team? Do you spin up backs and forwards? Does your keeper work on their own? The keeper should be doing the same work as the rest of the team. Now, sorry if this is old half to people, but this is, this is my opinion on the way that I would organise this. Players' perception of their best position is often totally wrong. <laughs> Players, you know, I used to, I used to, whenever I was younger, I always wanted to play centre half forward. You know, I always fancied myself as this kind of mercurial playmaker and got on the ball and made things happen on the pitch. But it wasn't because I was shy to play in there. You know, <laughs> couldn't play the position. I was better playing further back, coming onto the ball, or I could play in around the full forward line and pop it about and cause it a havoc because of the size. But I wasn't. Brian McGuigan, or you know anybody like that, but I thought it was. But the coach knew better. So players have a perception of their best position. And maybe Hart made a very common comment recently there about two weeks ago. We said we like footballers first, and positions come after that. What I would be saying is get your players as skilled as you can and get them conditioned and have them flexible so that they can play a number of different positions. Okay. So that you can say to, you know, if you say to a girl in a match, and you'll work through this in training with your different possibilities, you say to them, I want to switch you to one half back, that they'll go there without crapping it, going, Jesus, how do I play here? Because you'll have done it in training, okay? <coughs> I was talking about basic skills, and this applies um, to ladies football as well as for them. You need to familiarize players with the basic skills, and you need to repeat the skills over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? And Kimogi and Hurling, striking on both sides, lifting, tackling, hooking, blocking, catching the ball. All these are basics. Um, especially striking, um, and Kimogi is very, very, you know, you need to do a lot of striking with them. And not just a static strike, but striking under pressure. Drills where there's games were involved, the, the end result is a strike at goal, or a strike down the pitch, or a strike out to a particular target. Now, my daughter is playing under age Kimogi in our club, and they, they do hand passing. Okay? So she's under, she was under 10 at the time, and they're doing hand passing. And I said, why are you doing a hand passing? I said, if you catch the ball, I don't want to see you ever hand passing to somebody else. Because you've caught the ball. You have it. You think what happens if she catches the ball and she passes the other girl, the other girl's allowed to drop it. All right? So your, your coaching should be specific to your group. Whenever you get on up to a senior team, yeah, hand passing out of trouble, hand passing, whatever. Sean Paul was saying at lunchtime about Cork and, and uh, Wexford and all that only thing this year. Every time the players were pressed on the ball, they dropped the stick and offloaded the hand pass. Okay? You cannot get Ulster players to it. Can many of your girls do that? No. No. Very, very hard to get them to do them. Southern girls, second nature, as soon as they're boxed in, they drop the stick and offload the ball. Can you do it? Just like that. Good stuff. Because of what? 
a wild lot of yards here won't do it. They won't do it. Coming in front of the goal, drop a stick. Camogie, if anybody's footballers, you're right to have pass the ball on the goals in Camogie. Wild lot of players won't do it. So, you know, you need to have, have, a, have a skills that are appropriate. When my daughter's running about, the reward for catching the ball when you're about another 10, 10 or under 12 Camogie player should be that you, you get to strike the ball. But she's been told to run and hand pass it. And another bugbear is sold on the ball endlessly, up and down the pitch, meaninglessly. So whenever they come to the seniors, the first thing to do is to put the boiled egg in the pan and off they go run with this ball on the stick instead of getting the ball and learning to move it quickly down the field. Okay? I say these are my experiences. Other people, you know, you can disagree if you want, but that's my experiences. Okay, now the basic skills. Here's an example of the basic skills executed by a girl who is 15. This girl, you call really smart to me, our number five. She's played in two other and finals before she was once when she was 15, once she was 16. Okay, you see her here, going back, okay. There she goes, that's her there, okay, there goes the ice. So she's trying to play her back. Gets around the right side, instead of the space she makes up, bang, block. And what happens next? One of our players comes in and undoes all the good work by Fowler. But Ailey stood back and executed the block and showed all those wee bits of skill. I worked with a lot of work with Ailey on her blocking technique before that game. She blocked about four or five times during that game and executed the ball perfectly. I think we've got another one here. <coughs> here she goes again, number five, yellow hammer, but you see this one? Yeah. There goes Ailey, she's got another block. Alright? So those are the basic skills. Hooking and blocking and tackling and camogie are fundamental. The girls are doing with great relish because it's physical. They like getting stuck in. The thing about tackling and hooking and blocking is it turns over a ball and you get a lot of scores in camogie from turning over a ball. Okay? In terms of physical training, the normal rules apply. Um, when you're planning the session, as I say, periodization, beginning of the year and end of the year, you should plan about what you're doing at each individual stage of the season. Your, your work rate should be calibrated there, so you're doing the heavy work at the part, part of the season. And I would say you knock, if you're used to working with a hurling team or a football team, knock out about 10% or 15%. Okay, so they're working for a shorter period of time, and their recovery is, is adjusted accordingly, okay? And then whenever you're doing the speed work of the season, knock out about five seconds or three seconds or five seconds about what, what you're doing, because that's, that's what they're calibrated to do. Female athletes are calibrated. Um, Physically, they're just that weak, but not as, not as strong, okay? Player preparation, um, it's their team, so girls, you've got to get them to buy a little, okay? You should have yourself a menu of things that you want to cover. So at the beginning of the year, you should, you should be writing down the list, all the things that you want to, want to address. So make the things that you've picked up from games in the previous season. How many people here use video analysis for club games? Okay, I'll down, I know you do it. <laughs> I, I do it too. I do it too. <laughs> Anybody else? Do you see, to, I was, anybody was upstairs at Kevin and Mickey McCullough's talk earlier on about hurling? Anybody? Well, obviously there's a couple of there. A friend of mine, a guy of our club, I'm going to do a straight edge on some of his five kids and wife. A whole lot of family just took off lock, stock and borrow. A massive loss to our club, five boys away, not coming back. But he's involved in coaching out there. In Australia, they videotape uh, training sessions and they spot and fix errors there and then. So if you're running a drill and a girl's not bent over to jab lift the ball, we're talking about this earlier on the lane. The girl's not jab lift the ball the right way coming towards her. They, what they would do in Australia is they would tape that, okay, and they would stop and they'd say, Maisie, come here a minute. There's what you're doing, okay? All right? You're not doing this here. You should be doing it the same way as, you know, Anne there's doing it. Now we need to fix that. And they would work with that girl and they show her in real time what she's doing wrong. And he was telling me that um, in, the, in the AFL, they're giving out iPads preloaded with all these apps to coaches um, to, uh, you know, to help them with their coaching. Now, all you need at training is if you see a girl or a fella doing something over and over again. And remember, repetition of good things means that you do good things in the match. But repetition of bad things means you do bad things in the match. So all you do is you get your phone out and you can videotape them. There you are videotaping you now, okay? Doing the bad thing that you always do. Okay? Then I say, that's what you do in the match. Because most people, most people you know, don't really see what they do in training. They have a perception of what they do. And they also, the other thing you do is you should be getting videotapes. <coughs> and not all your matches, some of your matches. So you can show players, this is what happens in a match. 
We had a fella who, whenever he got the ball, he used to always run under the tackle. He used to, in football, he played a bit of rugby too, and he obviously enjoyed the physical contact. contact. But the boys were able to show him that of five times he got the ball, the four times that he ran under the tackle, he got dispossessed and they went up the pitch. The one time that he saw one country and headed out into space, the game was <coughs> great fun. It took showing the fella that in videotape to get him to realise that he was making the same mistake over and over and over again. Okay? Alright? Uh, the training then should be appropriate to the stage of the season. And I've talked about the 20%, 10-20% difference and the way you should adapt your session accordingly. This here is another example of how um, training and preparation gets a player ready for it. This is a uh, point. This here has got the boss. just goes the game down. She basically gets snarled up. That's driving the ball. Took a little acceleration. Look, she's out in the sideline, buying the balls over the bar. Just like that. Um, Grania practices shooting from out in the sideline. Okay. Anybody seen her do that? She, it doesn't happen by accident, Kevin. Yeah, she practices it. She practices it. just can't leave it clear, but she does all in a lot of work her own life. Yeah, and that's the thing about it is, you know, you'll find that for, for I mean, my, I have two lads who play hurling and football, three daughters. My wee wife's a good wee hurler, it's very skillful. I don't know if you'll ever have a little bit of a hurler, okay? But by God, the reason he's a good hurler is because he goes out in our backyard and he practices and practices and practices. And if he sees somebody doing something on TV, he wants to do it. Said so Sean Paul, he saw Joe Kelly shoot the left hand about two years ago. He went out and mastered that. He can play both sides. Not strikes two sides, he can play right handed and left handed. Okay? That's because he saw Kelly do that on TV. Alright? My daughter has to be encouraged, shall we say, to go out and play Kamobi. And I've said to her, if you if you don't practice, you know, you can't expect to improve. As a coach, you will have the players in your sphere of influence on the pitch for maybe three hours a week if you two sessions. You know, say an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, and talk to them a little bit before and a little bit after. So that's three, three, three hours maximum over the course of a good part of the season. If you have three sessions up to four and a half, the individual player contact time is going to be quite small then because you can't talk to everybody and you can't go through everything with everybody, okay? But what you're allowing on players is to take a bit of initiative and a bit of responsibility. And Adrian McGuckin mentioned this earlier on the talk. Players take responsibility and go and do the work on their own time. And you know, I've seen examples of players improve themselves who do that. Okay? You can really tell looking at the team the players who often walk and The other thing is um, tactical awareness. I've already said this might be controversial. I think girls' tactical awareness is poor. Um, and you have to work on it. John Wooden, anybody here read, read John Wooden? American basketball coach, very good, like Reading Wooden, yeah. Great advice for anybody involved in coaching, great practical advice of working and dealing with people. Roy Keane's fail to prepare, or pre fail to prepare, prepare, prepare to fail, or whatever. That was John Wooden said that first, didn't Roy Keane? But what Wooden says also, you haven't taught until they've learned. And this thing that I'm about at the minute, I don't know what Jim McGinnis does in training, but the myth is that Jim McGinnis goes over and over and over set plays in training until fellas are familiar with where they should run and what they do, okay? John Williams view that is if they if you turn around to a player and ask them to do something in a given situation and they still don't know how to do it, they haven't learned it yet, which means that they haven't been taught it, or you haven't taught it right, but they haven't uh, absorbed it correctly. So you've got to do stuff over and over again until they have learned it. Okay? Now that's bearing in mind that some players will be, you know, harder to, to, to learn than others, okay? The training pitch is the laboratory. Um, and I would say if I criticize a player for something in training and I haven't covered in the pitch, that's not their fault, it's mine. Okay? This thing about the player being able to hand pass the ball in the goals, that's my fault, not theirs. Okay? Now, a bit about decision making on the pitch. I said that's an important skill as well. This is the situation where a player gets a ball on the pitch, or they decide what to do next, or they decide what run to make. Have you ever listened to yourself coaching on the sideline? Okay? We got a videotape of the match <coughs> that we played last year, an important match. And the one thing that I noticed when I was going on the pitch was the cacophony of shouting from the sideline. Now it wasn't me, okay? I can be bad at times, but it wasn't me. It was somebody else. And I had to say to them afterwards, we need to calm it down here in the lane. Players need to be able to make decisions on their own. There's a fellow in our club who's ruined as a footballer. He'll never be a good footballer. He's got speed and a bit of skill, and he'll probably do all right on the senior team. He'll never do it because every time he played a football match for our under age teams, he'd have been playing there, and his old boy was always in the middle of the pitch beside him here, telling him what to do. Instead of shutting up and letting the boy go on with. So, you know, if you've got daughters and sons on the team, 
you need to be very careful um, that you don't ruin them. You know, you don't take a step back and try to be objective. Two words that I would ban them are shoot and have. I used to go down to the bar after our, team, our close football matches, and all these village idiots drinking said, he should have done this. You see that time the ball was kicked in there and he ran out there? He should have done that. And he should have took that time he tried to score a goal, he should have took the point. Okay, I, I stopped going to the bar because it, it does my head. You know, that's a good decision. Like, the reason that the boy didn't shoot, he should have done, the reason he didn't do it was he got the ball, okay, in that position, and he did the best he could in that position. And if he made a balls of it, he made a balls of it. Hopefully he learned the next time. He doesn't need some, you know, ways to ask him what to do. Okay, so they need decision making skills. And for me, the condition is getting drawn maybe silence, and I shut up and you tell other players to shut up. So that you see what they do without having somebody talking to them, okay? And there's why I think girls don't do tactics. They don't watch enough games. They don't play enough games. They don't watch football or hurling enough on TV or go to matches. And they don't play football. I mean, they don't go out and play soccer in the street, okay? And they no longer play hurling up to under 14. Our best players in the club are girls who are allowed to play up to under 14 hurling. Now you're not allowed to play beyond under 12. And to me, that's a stupid rule. And they've made a balls of things by introducing that. I don't know what the reason was. But girls physically up to under 14 were able to play hurling rightly, and they've taken that away and they shouldn't have done it. Last year, my son had 43 blitzes between football and hurling. You can argue well, that's too many, but that's a fact that's what we had in Derry. The daughter at 10, less than 10. You know, how's she going to learn? He possibly had too many and was like being overexposed. She done not enough. Okay, constructing training here. What around this is, I want to get this, this data just here at the end of it, okay? Um, and constructing training, you want to know where your drills are coming from, where do you get them from? Do you go along to watch somebody else? Or are you actually looking at what happens in a match situation with your girls or your fellas and saying, we weren't particularly good at dealing with that situation, so I'm going to create a drill out of my head that mimics that match situation to solve that problem. Does anybody do that? As of everybody does that. Okay, if you come back a week after a match and you're going right to the girls on the lines there, we'll run relays and stuff, that's all very good. But really what you should be doing is trying to say, Guys, last week there was two reasons we conceded a goal, and we're going to work on one of them here. You know, we're going to try and address that now, and I've set up a wee drill that, that deals with that, okay? So, some of mine are really some I have drills that are called after players that are set up to deal with individual players to, to address things that they do in matches. And some of them don't even realise that they, they have this focus of the drill, and everybody else does it once, and they might end up doing the thing of being in the middle three times, because it's for them, okay? The other thing is, I've touched on earlier on, feedback forms, questionnaires. You should ask your players what you're doing well and what you're doing badly. You know, it can be very uh, difficult to take on board someday, you know, uh, some things that are critical of you. But if you want to improve, that's what you've got to do. And I would be my biggest, my own strongest critic. Now, I wouldn't have been before, I would have been pers took it personally and been annoyed. People said they didn't enjoy the training, they didn't like it. But that, that would be beat by Lavi, I realised I have to go away. And I wrote down everything I thought we were doing wrong. And I went and spoke to other coaches and got ideas and changed what we were doing. And I asked players what they liked and what they don't like. So, for example, we never do anything the night before a match because the players don't like doing it. They don't do a puck around or anything. They're left their own devices. Don't do anything at all. Okay, the coach isn't always right. And the, the, the coach isn't always right in another way. If you have players on the pitch, and I learned this from Sean Neal and Gobert, coach, no one heard him. He'd come on over the side and he'd tell me, he'd say, go and switch me on the full forward line and I'll score a goal. And you can respond to that in two ways. You can say, F off, back out there, I'm the coach and I, I pick the team and don't you be telling me what to do. Or you can say, right, go on in there. And you switch the team around. And the thing was, he kept going on and scoring goals. You know, I would, if, if, if there's two perspectives on, on, on the line pitch, there's what you're doing on the scene on the sideline and what actually goes on the pitch. And if the players are going back to you saying, well, we, you know, we can't be doing that because number 11 is running free and you haven't seen that from the side. You've got to take on board what they're saying. What they're saying. Okay, now just very quickly, then we'll go through this. Okay, okay. Um, last I'm year, we'll over time, Joe, and everything. Uh, well, at this point, about seven months, maybe five to ten. Okay, but this last year, um, uh, I was asked to take the Ulster team, which was a great privilege. I was really delighted to be asked to do it. Um, and an opportunity to work with the best movie players in Ulster. And um, what was even better was the kind of asked to come out and play, come out and play. Okay. Um, and we've got 15 starting there with about another 10 or 11 on the, on the bench who were you know, equally able to go and play the game. The way Ulster, the Camogie, the Camogie Inter Provincial Works Office, most of you know, is it's all played off in one day. Like. So, Munster turned up with Jill Horn and Breeze Corkery and Jennifer O'Leary and uh, the big tall girl who plays for Cork, Orla Cotter. All these girls turned up. 
And I think they thought Ulster were going to roll over and let them tramp all over us, okay? But the Ulster girls weren't. They were wound up for the game. And it was the most high intensity, hell for a dollar thing I've ever seen. You can see for the final score there, it was 121 to 314. They won by a point. They scored a goal. I think it's near the end of the game to win it. But the players sent off. We didn't deal that as well as we could have. I could have done better than that myself. But Kevin McGuigan from Ulster put GPS units on 10 of the players, okay? So um, that, the, they're like a harness, like a sports bra and the GPS unit in the back. So he gave me the back of the data a week later and we were able to take a look at what the, the workload was, you know? And the thing about well, the, the GPS is um, <coughs> clubs and counties are really for about 800 or 1,000 pound sessions, okay? So the player comparisons there are A, B, C, D and E are five of the Ulster players. And the player F ball, that's Kevin himself playing a match for nearly Shamrocks, a football match, which he uses to control. Okay? So the top thing is the distance in meters covered during the game. Alright. Uh, player A, nearly 8,000 meters. Player B, he was playing around the full four line, 5,800. Player C, playing out around midfield, 8,200. Player D, 8,000. Player D, 7. So that's in the whole episode of the game, warm up in two, two halves. That's they were covering between six and eight kilometers, okay? All right. The maximum velocity is the fastest speed. Three of them sprinted flat out over 16 miles an hour, okay? Um, the meters they were covering by minute, per minute on average, 90, 66, again, that's the girl playing around the full four, nine, 94, 99, 89. The high, <coughs> high intensity acceleration, um, you can see that there compared to um, Kevin's. Now, he threw up the other area on upstairs of the Tipperary and Antrim Hurling team. I wasn't aware of that before I came down here today. Okay? The Tipperary players in the match he calibrated there were covering 7,249 metres in their 70 minute game. Okay? So it's comparable, isn't it? Antrim were covering 6,300. Okay, that's comparable. UCD hurlers in a hurling match were covering 6,057. Now, I'm not sure whether Kevin logged the, the warm up or not, but even 6,057, you can see at the bottom there, the first and second half, that's the first half mileage and the second half. You can see at the distance covered by the girls playing for Ulster. Now, bear in mind, a lot of you are, well, most people here are probably club community coaches. This is the top end. This is the Ulster girls going absolutely full bar against the best players. I mean, there was three or four individual contests that you would have paid good money to watch. You know what I mean? Like, really good money. I mean, Ailey McCusker was Mark and Jill Horn, and that was hell for another stuff. And Ailey actually said, she was interviewed before the All-Ireland this year, about the toughest opponent she'd ever played. And she said she marked uh, uh, Jill Horn in the Interventions, and it was the toughest opponent she'd ever marked. Because Horn, if any of know her, she's like and she never bloody stops. She won the whole game, and Ailey McCusker went with it the whole game. All right? And you knew coming off the pitch, they were all red in the face. And over the other pitch, Connacht was playing Leinster, and it was a lovely night of the game with lots of skill and all. Munster were absolutely wrecked for their final. They couldn't play, they got hammered by Leinster in the final, because the Ulster girls had taken that much out of them. Now, if we'd have been through the final, we'd have been probably hammered too, because they were wrecked. But a match, there's no obviously to only match the score 121 to 314. The name's waving on me here, I'm sure, so we'll just get a couple of others. The movements there, um, just the breakdown there, you can see there that these are the, the players against the footballers, I picked three of them. You can see that off their total distance, how much of it they walked, how much of it they jogged, how much of it they went at half pace, how much of three, those are meters by the way there, okay? How much they went at half pace, three quarter pace, or how much they sprinted. Now the only thing I'd say about those things is the sprint needs to be probably calibrated down because the parameters for a male athlete were used. Okay, so for a female, you should probably adjust that slightly. So these are kind of male figures that are used. Also note the players D and E recorded impacts, collisions and tackles equivalent to those recorded in impacts in male you know, sports. So the, the unit has a gyroscope on it, okay? So if I barge down the lame side, I was coming out with the ball and he hits me a slap and I'm flying backwards, that's recorded in the gyroscope, okay? That's recorded in the gyroscope. So in terms of the physical contact, some of it was an equivalence to what you would see in her in football, okay? So how does this re relate to you guys in a coaching session? Well, elite, elite players, and I'm talking about an elite player, county level in Ulster, and presumably Munster, they must be able to run 68.5 kilometres in a game, depending on their position. The average was 7.4 kilometres. So you should be 
Players want to have an aerobic endurance there around about that, okay? They, you're looking at the flat out sprints at that level, 14 to 16 and a half miles per hour. They're covering 65 to 95 meters per minute. The average there was 86.4. You'll this again to do with the intensity and the workload that you put on them in training, okay? The accelerations are sudden movements, over 210 in a match. So your training should have drills where you have to move suddenly and stop, change direction, cut, run back and forth, that mimics the match situation. And different positions will make different demands. It was very clear that the full forward player had a different set of data than the players out of feet. And remember, all the time these players are lifting the ball, they're striking it, they're hooking, they're blocking, they're trying to you know cover back, they're making decisions, they're getting fatigued, they're being switched, they're having to common, assimilate new information, they're marking a new player who's got different skills, their level of alertness is going down as they get tired, and their discipline is expected to be maintained the whole time. And discipline instead of giving away any stuff, they're expected to stand up and put the time in the game. So, <coughs> there's just the percentages of the data. But percentages aren't dissimilar to the footballer, okay, in terms of what they do during the game. So, the outcomes of that for me, when you make the coaching relevant to the match, you reflect the nature of the game, the types of running impacts, the skill sets, and the tackling. You've got to do that in your, in your sessions. Pressure and intensity and decision making all need to be there. Your drills have got to be game based. We create the match situation so it's familiar to them. So when they step out on a big day, there's nothing, as far as possible, as far as you can control it, there's nothing absolutely new. If you educate them and coach them well enough, when they do encounter something new from the bits and pieces they do know, they'll be able to hopefully um, you know, take it on board and deal with it. Okay? And what I've learned as a coach, um, I never started out as a Kimberley coach, I started out coaching football and underage Herman and coached our senior herders for and coached our minor footballers and involved with under eight football and hurling at the moment. What I've learned from coaching the one row senior Kimobi team is that it's made me become a better coach. Okay, I've had to go and learn, I've had to go and uh, go to sessions, go to Ulster GAA sessions, go to professional development. The day came and he's a name on Shea up in the Dunlawy, one of the best ever, one of the best ever. Absolutely fantastic forced me to become a better coach. And that's because the players deserved, you know, a high quality product for the commitment that they were prepared to put in it. And you know, I was prepared to do that and they were prepared to do it. And you know, finally, most of all, the journey is the reward. I've been to Croke Park twice, and that's great. But the crack we had along the way, you would never give it up for anything. Okay? So hopefully that's me finished with that. Hopefully you've got a bit of that that's of use. Um, I'll be answering any questions around that. Folks, you'd agree that Joe is, is it was fascinating and interesting and, and uh, educate, edu I don't know what the end of that word, educational as well. And uh, I was so enthralled that I forgot to get your presentation out so, so that the uh, audience can see it. Sure. Well, it looks like a Christmas morning, Joe. <laughs> so, Joe, great, thank you very much. I don't want to put Joe under any pressure and like that there, or, or, seriously. You see the, the, the stuff there, like I'd be fascinated, 